As they often do, the Supreme Court closed out their latest session with the most controversial cases on their docket, sending down decisions that gutted affirmative action, allowed a web designer to refuse to create wedding websites for same-sex couples, and blocked President Biden's plan to cancel billions of dollars in student loan debt. Just a few days before those rulings came down, hundreds marched across Washington to protest a ruling the court made last year, overturning Roe v. Wade and the federal right to access abortion. In last year's midterms, nearly a quarter of voters told the AP that decision was, quote, the single most important factor in their vote. Now, as we inch closer and closer to the 2024 election, how could all these rulings affect the upcoming presidential race? I'm joined by UMass Amherst poll director Tatish Nateta and Jesse Mermel, the founder and president of DeWitt Impact. Thank you both for being here. Tatish, let's start with affirmative action, since Harvard was involved in that case and since Massachusetts is such a hotbed of higher ed. You polled on attitudes around affirmative action before that ruling came down. What were the big takeaways that you and your colleagues came up with? Yeah, I think it's in line with polling that we've seen over the course of the last decade. Um, Americans are in some ways ambivalent as it pertains to affirmative action. We found a plurality of Americans oppose affirmative action. And the specific questioning was really looking at whether or not uh, colleges should take into account race or ethnicity on the admissions process alongside things like GPA, um, letters of recommendation, as well as test scores. And we found about 40% uh, of Americans oppose this. But I say ambivalent because on the other side, you have a number of Americans that don't have an opinion and a number of Americans that support the policy. So it's not majoritarian uh, in terms of the distribution of opposition. But at the same time, you see more Americans opposing affirmative action, and that's in line with much of the polling that we've seen from uh, other polling firms. Just to drive home the numbers that you're talking about, we have a couple of graphics. Uh, first, as you said, 42 percent of people in your poll conducted in late May and early June opposed the use of or consideration of race and ethnicity in addition to other factors, 33 percent supported it. And one finding that struck me was that even among the, the strongest supporters of affirmative action, the support was pretty weak. Among black and African-American respondents, just 52 percent said they supported the consideration of race and ethnicity in higher ed admissions. 51 percent of self-identified liberals, 51 percent of people with postgraduate degrees. Am I right to be surprised by that relatively soft support, even in those groups, Tatish? Uh, in some ways, no. Affirmative action is not a very popular policy. Um, and our polling demonstrates this. So across various demographic groups, whether you look at uh, age, whether you look at gender identity, uh, class, education um, uh, level, you find very little support, majoritarian support for this policy. Mm. And this is, again, in line with uh, polling that you see at Pew, at Gallup, that you know affirmative action is not necessarily, at least in 2023, an extremely popular policy outside of core Democratic constituencies. So, Jesse Mermel, when I look at the numbers that we've been talking through with Tatish, my immediate conclusion is, okay, this is not a ruling that is going to boost Democrats in 2024 the way the Dobbs ruling did in the last election cycle. Am I right or am I being too simplistic? Respectfully, I think you're being too simplistic. <laughs> Lay it on me. I want to hear why. Because this ruling doesn't exist in a vacuum. This ruling in the, exists in the context of Dobbs, which is disproportionately impacting people of color. This, this ruling exists in the context of, which I know we'll talk about, the student debt ruling, mm -hmm. which very significantly disproportionately impacts people of color and is obviously tied to who gets to pursue higher education, given the affirmative action study, and uh, affirmative action ruling, excuse me, and exists in the context of the LGBTQ plus discrimination ruling that happened. All of these things are going to be talked about together on the campaign trail between now and next November. And I think that cumulative story is going to be incredibly motivating. Dobbs and Roe in and of itself, we've already seen, has been driving voters to the yeah. polls. This, I think, together will increase voter turnout exponentially. All right, let's kick around this idea that, that you've just voted, that there's a bigger narrative that's waiting to be crafted that will be powerful. You mentioned the, the ruling on business owners being allowed to deny services to LGBTQ customers if, in fact, providing those services would violate their personal beliefs in some way. Um, there was a Pew poll conducted on that, again, before the ruling came down. I want to bring up those numbers. 60% of people polled by Pew in late March and early April said that business owners should be able to refuse to provide services to LGBTQ 
customers over objections they might have, and only 38% said they shouldn't. Again, I, I don't want to sound overly naive talking about these findings in terms of surprise or lack of surprise, but I was struck by that because that suggests to me that at least in that ruling, the court came down on the side of public opinion in much the same way, maybe even more so than they did with affirmative action. So when you talk about creating a, a coherent narrative that ties these things together, isn't that tough to do if in more than one case the court is actually in step with what the public's thinking right now? I don't think so, because what you're talking about is how folks feel on any given day. What I'm talking about is how pumped are you on election day? to go out there and vote, to stand in the rain, to wait in long lines, and in the weeks beforehand to donate to phone bank, to hit the doors and work. I, I think this still matters in a huge, huge way. I think the collective story matters. And I think that, um, you know, as we already he heard, this is about those core Democratic voters. Core Democratic voters understand that popular opinion shouldn't dictate rights. And when the court has pushed in favor of advancing people's rights, we have seen overwhelming support and joy from, from people. And to see the court rolling that back is not just disheartening on a personal level, it is going to be hugely motivating to multiple categories of voters next fall. The Democrats just have to tell the story and turn people out. Tatish, my recollection is that you and your UMass colleagues, you did not poll recently on President Biden's debt relief plan. Am I right about that? If I'm wrong, tell oh, yeah. me, because I don't want to miss it. Okay. No, my yeah. we, we polled uh, about a year ago on that plan. And again, there was relative ambivalence on that, on that plan. Okay, I was, so that puts you, uh, again, in step with other pollsters who found, it seems to me like, just based on my cursory research, kind of an even split. Maybe some more people in some recent polling in favor of the president's plan that was tossed out by the court, but pretty close, about half and half. Um, do you buy Jesse's idea that core Democratic constituencies can be activated in some of these rulings that we're discussing, especially if they're tied together, even if public opinion, broadly speaking, might suggest that these aren't taken individually winners for the Democratic Party. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think the the issue here is that, you know, the Supreme Court, now with the 6-3 conservative majority, uh, is pushing through on policies that, you know, a lot of Democrats have argued should be dealt with at the congressional level and the presidential level. So whether or not you protect LGBTQ rights, questions regarding affirmative action, these aren't necessarily in a lot in the minds of, I think, a lot of Democratic constituencies, issues that should be dealt with by the high court, but should be dealt with more at the legislative level. And I think making the, the claim that the court itself is increasingly becoming a policymaking institution and something should be done about the court is going to mobilize not just core Democratic constituencies, but I think a lot of Americans are increasingly concerned about what role the court is playing in our political institutions, our political, in our politics more generally. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be mobilizing, not just for core Democratic constituencies, but for large swaths of America. And Jesse, I, yeah, I saw you nodding as Tatish was making that Yeah, point. well, two, two things. One, I, I totally agree with Tatish. The, the idea that we have to do something about the court is very much picking up steam. I mean, you're seeing the movement to expand the court really develop momentum that it hasn't had in recent years. Um, with all due respect to Tatish and to pollsters, you know, I think back to what those of us in the reproductive health and abortion rights movement have been saying for years about how strongly voters feel about abortion rights. And we were, how should I put this generally, uh, ignored, mocked, completely pushed aside. It turns out we were right. We're hearing from black and brown voters and activists on the ground, from LGBTQ plus activists, from student leaders, how angry they are, how motivated they are. And with all due respect to pollsters and data, which is a huge piece of this puzzle, I think we need to learn a lesson from Roe and Dobbs and listen to the activists on the ground and understand how central this is going to be to turning people out next November. Uh, Tish, I got to give you a chance to weigh in there since Jesse suggested that the polling establishment, broadly speaking, she wasn't actually, I didn't see her point a finger in no. your direction, that, but that pollsters didn't quite pick up on how animating uh, the issue of abortion rights was going to be to a lot and of not voters. Just pollsters. I'll throw an elbow at you. The media as well, right? The talking, the chattering classes. No oh, one now you've understood. Gone too far. I know, I know, I know. We're gonna we're gonna scratch this. Like, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, um, but the entire chattering class didn't understand what Roe meant. Tatish, do you think she's uh, got a point there? Love to hear your take. Um, I don't. I don't know if that's the case. If we look at the last election, as you sort of moved closer to election day, we saw voters 
particularly core Democratic constituencies, young people, liberals, um, urban voters, all pointing to questions regarding democracy, you know, democracy is under threat, but also abortion as one of the sort of central mobilizing factors. If you look at Gallup polling over time, we're seeing close to seven in 10 Americans supporting abortion rights, and in particular, um, uh, legalizing abortions in the first trimester. So I think polling's in some ways in lockstep with where the movement regarding uh, the creation or at least the protection of abortion rights is. And as we get closer to 2024, I think we're going to see abortion becoming one of the central issues uh, mobilizing people to vote and one of the central issues defining the Republican and Democratic candidates for president and across the ballot. This is exactly the note I wanted to end on. I want to give you the last word here, Jesse. But first, before I do, I want to pull up some more findings. This is from an NBC News poll taken in June around the one-year anniversary of the Dobbs ruling. And it showed incredibly strong disapproval across a number of groups for the court's ruling in Dobbs. 61 percent disapproved of it, 36 percent only approved. And one thing that really struck me, in contrast with some of what we were talking about earlier, is how strong the disapproval was in group after group after group. 55% of men disapproved of Dobbs, 67% of women, 77% of younger women ages 18 to 49. 78% of black voters, 70% of Latino voters, and 60% of independents. So I guess my closing question for you, Jesse, is do you trust President Biden, who sometimes has been somewhat lukewarm in his formulations of his support for abortion rights, do you trust him to take the message that that poll delivers and that Tatish was talking about, to take it out on the campaign trail and use it to win? I do, and I'll tell you why. It's because I Listen, there's no question that President Biden has moved on this issue. He said the other day that he's not necessarily, you know, he doesn't love talking about abortion he policy. I, I wish that he were more comfortable with it. I, I praise him for the movement that he's made. I wish he was more comfortable. That said, Vice President Kamala Harris has been a champion on this for decades, has been an incredibly vocal leader in the past few years, in the past 13 months, since Dobbs in particular. And I know that the president is surrounded by leaders and advisors who very much understand this. So I trust that not just President Biden, but the vice president and the entire Democratic establishment will be out there in every single state, in every single state, campaigning on abortion rights and on the other issues that we just talked about. All right, we'll have to watch and have you come back and talk about what they're That's doing right. or not doing. Jesse Mermel, Tatish Natata, thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you.